I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges I think that we see when we attempt to do gender analysis um, through a political science framework, um, particularly I think some of the dominant work to date. Um, and I probably the bulk of the presentation will talk about these sort of challenges that I see coming from a political settlements perspective to those of us who are interested in um, questions of women's inclusion, but also I think gender analysis more broadly and, and bringing out gendered actors and gender dynamics of political settlements. Um, that'll, I think, lead in then to a discussion of what we're trying to do, uh, certainly in some of the projects within the political settlements research program, uh, where I think quite uniquely and for the first time we really have put gender to the fore of the work um, of political settlements research. Um, and then if I have time, I'll just conclude a little bit with my, my own particular projects um, that I'm doing and where I think I, I do see value um, it's going to sound for the first kind of 15 minutes that I, I'm throwing out political settlements and not quite. Um, the last few minutes will I think comment a little bit about why I think it may be helpful um, to some of the questions that we're thinking about. Okay, so uh, to comment, so thinking then about some of the conceptual problematics of political settlements, and already of course we've had Fanula's contribution on this already. Um, and I think it's not exactly uh, it's not exactly rocket science to sort of think that a focus on elites um, will structurally exclude women um, from our, our sort of framework of analysis. I mean, it's a trite point, but I think nevertheless one keeping to the fore. Um, but it's uh, it's there's also it's also pretty clear that we, we don't. It's not always easy to tell who the elites are, um, and in defining who elites are, there's I think there's a lot of scope there for gender bias and sort of gender assumptions about who elites might be in the room. And I think sometimes a lack of recognition about just how dynamic um, those elite dynamics can be. Um, I think links to this focus on elites is uh, the question really of what is the role of social movements uh, in, in the political settlement, in, in potentially disrupting the political settlement, um, in contesting its dynamics. And, and I think in particular um, for the, in terms of women's movements and, and those who are pushing kind of agendas around gender equality. And what is the capacity of social movements to influence um, to influence the political settlement? And um, this is part of a longer paper where I talk about this in a little more detail. But I do think that if we sort of structurally kind of marginalize social movements in this conversation, we're marginalizing a space where women are likely to be um, certainly more visibly, <coughs> visible, um, but also where in many cases our key actors advocating for gender equality um, are marginalized. Uh, then, I think in terms of more conceptual exclusions, um, this question of kind of public sphere dynamics, and this I think came out I think quite nicely in, in Sam's presentation yesterday. Um, so <coughs> for those of us who are kind of new to political settlements, but have been doing the gender thing for quite a long time, um, the idea that we would discuss things like maternal mortality rates or women's reproductive health um, purely with reference to um, elite interactions between the president and strong men um, is, is, I think, counterintuitive in many ways, right? Because we would think about, actually, there's probably a lot going on there in terms of intra-household gender power dynamics that are going to be influencing those, um, those development outcomes at least as much, and perhaps even more so, than conversations at the elite level um, around um, policy priorities. And <coughs> this signals, I think, quite a clear kind of structural exclusion of the private sphere, private sphere dynamics, right? The assumption that the family of a sort of black box that's kind of free of political interactions or, or, or change even. Um, and that I think is probably, in many ways, one of the more troubling aspects I think of a lot of political settlements work that's been done to date um, and its understanding of development outcomes as um, an outcome of public sphere elite interactions. And um, then I think finally in terms of these kind of key conceptual issues is this question of sort of how Gender is operationalized as a category of analysis within political settlements work, uh, particularly that's been done to date. Um, generally speaking, if you look through the political settlements literature, you'll see fairly limited interaction, I think, with even with feminist development scholars um, with political settlements work. Okay? So in some sense, the scholarly frame of reference, I think, has probably uh, not yet made full use of, of gender literature that might be <coughs> of value. And this manifests in all sorts of ways. It means that um, there's a very common slippage from women to gender. Uh, there's uh, a pretty narrow operationalization of gender as a research agenda. So for example, looking only at things like women's movements and domestic violence laws 
but certainly not thinking of male actors as gendered, um, as elite interactions as gendered, um, as political settlements arguably themselves about hierarchies of masculinity, right? So this kind of essentialization of gender as a category of analysis, I think, is also something that is, um, in, in many ways, I think, a necessary consequence of the other conceptual shortcomings, um, but one that becomes quite problematic when we do try to think um, more constructively about how to use political settlements to understand gender dynamics um, in transitions and other types of uh, other types of change settings. So these conceptual exclusions lead into them, I think, uh, lead into and emerge from another set of challenges that I'm kind of classifying <coughs> as epistemological challenges, right? Um, and this I've already alluded to in some respect, which is um, the need for reflexivity in defining elites. <laughs> um, and this I think was brought out very powerfully um, by the contribution earlier today about, you know, who are we in this room? Um, what are the power dynamics that structure knowledge production in this field? Um, in particular, I think, given the acknowledged sort of uncertainty, um, malleability, fuzziness <laughs> around just what elites are um, in a political settlement's context, I mean, it's, it brings, I think, quite a lot of power to those in the room who have the authority to name elites, right? Because when you name the elites, then you identify who should be engaged with in order to um, sustain your political settlement. So that's, I mean, potentially, I think, quite a powerful piece of epistemic violence. Um, that we need to think about in doing knowledge production in this area. And the sort of construction of certain groups as elites and others as non-elites. And given the conceptual fuzziness here, um, it's, there's an awful lot of potential for gender bias um, to enter these kinds of definitions. Um, so elites happen to be primarily male, but maybe, maybe being male, maybe when we look around the room to see who the elites are, you know, maybe Maybe maleness is a characteristic of eliteness as much as eliteness is a characteristic um, of maleness. So I think some of that, um, you know, I think kind of classic kind of Foucauldian insights and feminist epistemology can be quite useful really in, in thinking about some of these issues as we attempt to um, bring definition to elites in particular political settlements. And of course, um, these concepts have practical implications because if we define our problem as uh, the, you know, the need to sort of secure consensus amongst elites. Um, well, that has all sorts of uh, problems then in terms of, you know, what is the policy prescription when you don't have consensus amongst elites? Who is it who's valued for inclusion? Um, the other, I think, um, epistemological challenge that we have with the political settlements framework is this question of the dominance of the rational actor model. And um, again, uh, Sam, I think, spoke to this very nicely yesterday, and, and some of the work that they've been attempting to do in their program around, uh, around he, he said bolting on ideas, and I think he won't mind if I, if I quote him on that, bolting on ideas, and sort of thinking about elites as motivated not just, um, not just by material interests, but also potentially by uh, ideas and ideologies. Now, I think this is really quite an important entry point um, if we are interested in questions of gender, because actually ideas and ideologies about preferred gender roles, gender norms, <laughs> appropriate relationships of gender amongst elites and, and in non-elite um, communities, but that actually can be quite important in structuring, in structuring incentives, but also in st structuring elite perceptions of their interests, right? So, um, and actually sometimes that can run against their material interests. And the classic example here is, you know, we all know that women's labor force participation is good for the economy, but actually women's labor force participation can be disruptive to under gen other gender norms that might be more valued by certain elites, right? So I think we, we really radically need to sort of rethink this question of a rational actor model um, and the assumption that it's all about interests. And also the idea that interests can be read off particular scenarios um, in, in ways that are clear and obvious. Um, because um, actually, there's quite a lot of literature that tells us that interests are dynamic, they're shifting, um, they're not always, we are not always rational in, in thinking about these things. Um, and those insights, I think, can be helpful too. Um, so from these epistemological challenges, um, I want to talk a little bit then more practically about methodological challenges presented by the political settlements framework if we attempt to, to take gender seriously. <coughs> I'm racing through this. Uh, <laughs> and, and this is the other way of gender as a descriptive or explanatory variable. So I, I think in particular what can be troubling, I think, around some of the political settlements work is the assumption that development outcomes accrue to men and women, girls and boys equally. 
Okay. The assumption that uh, development outcomes um, in, in whatever your metric is, and, and Sam gave us an example of a few yesterday, um, the assumption that those sorts of economic benefits uh, will accrue equally to men and women, boys and girls. Right? But that is, uh, that is I think, a, a problematic assumption um, for those of us who do this work. Uh, it's certainly, and, and also just given the conceptual sort of exclusions around gender um, that we see in a lot of political settlements work, um, if we don't look for gender differentials, we won't find them. Right. So actually, unless you are actually sort of proactive and thinking about, um, you know, for example, you know, what price of, you got your oil for uh, or sold it for, you know, what, what is the gender differentials um, around that? Um, how do those power, how do those resource differentials at a league level, how do they then play out at the intra-household intra level um, when it comes to people who control resources and how the control of resources within households influences um, gender interactions as well? that um, unless we call those uh, issues into view, we won't be able to actually name them, and we certainly won't be able to measure them. Uh, and then, yes, uh, the failure to expressly investigate men. Um, I think the, um, <laughs> the assumption that, um, this, the unspoken assumption that elites are men or men are elite, I think leads us into this sort of um, kind of dead, a bit of a, research cul-de-sac, right, where we, we never feel the need to interact, you know, to investigate what are the relationships of masculinity between uh, male, male elites, if, if they are indeed predominantly male elites, or, or perhaps, you know, women who manage to penetrate those circles. Um, to what extent, and here I think actually there's quite a lot of rich literature uh, within the gender conflict field, um, and Fanula alluded to some of that earlier, um, where we know that actually perceptions um, perceptions of loss of status, loss of esteem, loss of resources, that those sorts of perceptions can be um, really very damaging, I think, uh, in a post-conflict setting uh, where there are perceptions of a loss of male status. Um, and also, I mean, it's, it's not too far, I think, to go to say that political settlements kind of are about renegotiating hierarchies of masculinity as well, right, in terms of how do I keep my prestige um, and my kind of gender privilege uh, in this moment of potential change and transition. Um, and if we don't acknowledge the fact that we are gendered actors in political settlements, then we make lots of assumptions about who elites are and we fail to really investigate them <coughs> potentially as relationships amongst men that aren't just about material interests, but also about a range of other things that really are linked to kind of gender norms and, and ideal gender types. Uh, but, but actually it's bias, yeah, and this again I think speaks to some of the themes that came out yesterday. Um, so my, you'll see this, I, mean, I have a particular interest in international law obligations and norms around gender equality and, and how they can potentially uh, leverage inclusion in, in domestic political <coughs> settings. So I, and sometimes I come to the kind of political settlements with a very different kind of level of analysis. I'm, I'm quite interested in the international, the suprastate dynamics, Supper state dynamics around women's coordinating across borders, um, ways in which that might be useful then in leveraging inclusion in, in domestic processes. Um, and I think what's sort of uh, surprising to me then when I look at some of the explanations that come from political settlements um, around things like the adoption of domestic violence laws in for case studies. Um, I mean, the analysis is very interesting to me, but. It loses sometimes, I think, the fact that actually we've had um, the adoption of domestic violence laws in you know 50 plus countries in a pretty short frame of time. Some of those were transitional, some of them weren't, some of them were developed, some of them were developmental. And when we pay, when we get very preoccupied with the local level dynamics, sometimes I think we may be missing that kind of <coughs> picture. So the story of why a domestic violence law in a particular setting, and that story is told with reference to there was a particular civil servant who was sympathetic to a particular woman in the elite who she played tennis with, and then that meant that they got their domestic violence law, right? Or else, you know, there's some kind of quirk of kind of the local setting that may in that moment have been important to the law, but actually misses quite a lot of what was going on, um, certainly at a transnational level. And actually, we have a lot of very good literature on that. We have a lot of good literature on norm diffusion, transnational networking, um, why states comply with their international obligations. We have a lot of very good literature on that that is helpful um, in explaining political settlements and gendered outcomes 
um, if we choose uh, to make use of that. Okay. And then um, finally, then this uh, in terms of my layers of challenges, uh, political challenges. So I think over here I'm speaking more as a feminist scholar than as a gender scholar, but I think. Um, as feminist scholars, we take our we wear our politics on our sleeves in many ways, and we, we, we wear that and we own that in terms of our scholarship. <laughs> and um, that, I think, gives rise to challenges around our scholarly rigor sometimes. But it does mean that we're at least we're open about it, um, and we um, acknowledge that sort of work. I think the assumption within the political settlements framework that you can kind of apolitically read off political dynamics. Um, is really contrary to what a lot of us would hold dear in terms of our kind of starting points of, of this work. Um, that you can sort of apolitically read off, you know, what are the power dynamics that matter um, within this particular country setting or, or sub-state um, sub level. Uh, and that is problematic. And the claim that you can do that in a way that is apolitical, um, I think, is troubling. Uh, and I think in particular, <laughs> it means that by, by claiming to do this stuff apolitically and anormatively, <coughs> that there's a danger that of not acknowledging the implicit gender norms that you end up endorsing through your work. Um, and here I think, um, and to be fair, I think, I think Sam was robust in challenging this, but there's certainly a, there's certainly a stream of political settlements work that this kind of says, the kind of going with the grain, the sort of we need to pursue marginal gains, we can't do the transformation thing. And I mean, there may indeed be contexts in which that's appropriate. Um, but we also need to acknowledge that the decision to not do something is, a, is also a normative position, right? And the decision that you're going to attempt to make marginal gains within larger structural gender inequality in particular, that's a normative position. Um, you're just deciding whether or not you're going to acknowledge it. Um, and I think that that then becomes very important in terms of the prospects of whether or not actually these can be even aspired to be transformative projects or instead become something that reaffirm existing inequalities. Okay. So um, with those challenges, um, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing within the Political Settlements Research Program, I have two minutes, uh, to I think try to challenge some of those limitations and challenges um, that I've identified. So for example, we have quite a lot of work within the gender stream that's looking at issues of gender-based violence. Right? And one of the key ways in which we approach gender-based violence is looking at how these ostensibly private sphere dynamics, um, and in particular my colleague Monica McWilliams with Jessica Doyle is looking at the evolution of experiences of domestic violence during the Northern Ireland conflict and since, um, and how that's changed form and nature. Um, and actually thinking about how those private sphere, black box, family type dynamics actually has quite an important implication for whether or not women have the capacity to then begin to attempt to leverage um, the political settlement, the public sphere political settlement dynamic. Um, what are we measuring in terms of outcomes? And here I think gender-based violence is quite a good example. Um, if we're measuring stability, um, an end, you know, if we're trying to capture uh, whether or not there's been a move uh, to an end of conflict, an end of conflict violence, um, then also we need to think about what we're measuring, uh, what are the forms of violence that we're measuring, um, are we capturing whether child violence changes in form rather than level? Um, those sorts of questions uh, that uh, my colleague Ashley Swain is thinking about and that we're trying to think more about more broadly. And then also I think the very important question that Christine raised yesterday, which was sort of how do we measure process as an outcome? Um, and these are all questions that I think we're trying to engage with um, in meaningful ways. Um, and then again, this question of who counts for inclusion. And I think this again goes to sort of um, what are, <clears throat> how we're approaching elites and defining elites and non-elites, um, and whose inclusion then we decide to value um, when we're measuring political settlements. And, and this is not just a sort of evaluation question, but it's also, it's a methodological question. It's about how we're doing the work. And here I think um, Alice Rooney's work, um, the grassroots transitional justice, and likewise the conciliation resources works around practice labs, that actually um, in including these actors, in speaking to them, in getting, in um, having them in this conversation, I think that we are saying something about who we're valuing for inclusion um, in how we understand political settlements. Um, I'm going to be, I'm done, right? Yeah, 20 minutes. Uh, I'm done. <laughs>
So, just uh, so this is actually perfect because I don't have to talk about this book that I'm definitely writing for soon. Uh, <laughs> uh, my own particular project that I alluded to this at the start was uh, I have a particular interest in how international <coughs> law norms for gender equality, how they can be useful as resources, uh, in particular to women's movements who are trying to, ne to negotiate or secure inclusion in domestic peace building. And, um, Despite all of the problems of the, the political settlements framework that I, I outlined, um, where I am finding the political settlements framework useful is in, in one sense, there's something quite refreshing about the kind of doing politics thing, that, you know, avowedly doing politics. I think that that can be quite helpful to some of the sort of gender technocracy that we've seen emerge around things like women, peace, and security. The idea that it's all just about models and institutions, and if we get those right, the other stuff will follow. I mean, I quite like the way political settlements challenges that and challenges us to think about the informal dynamics that underpin those institutions and, and practitioners. Um, and also, I think, in nuancing the state. So I think there can be, um, in, in feminist work on international law, I think sometimes we can be a little, we can be very complex in talking about international law and not complex enough about talking about the state. Um, and actually, the ways in which um, international law obligations and, and norms become incorporated at the domestic level and what are the <coughs> domestic uh, circumstances that are receptive to those norms. Um, and there, I think, political settlements also um, offers us something that is helpful. Um, so with that, I'm going to conclude almost almost on time. Um, obviously, there's a lot to talk about here. I think in terms of kind of more broadly the work that we're doing in the program, and a number of my colleagues here um, can speak to that also. So I look forward to um, your questions and contributions.